Uh, Robin is a professor of developmental psychology. Uh, we're going to talk about the Crest Research Lab. So that means children's relationships, emotions, and social skills. Warm welcome to Robin. Thank you so much. It's really lovely to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the work that I do as a researcher in developmental psychology at the University of Sussex. Um, I carry out research on children's mental health in the school context particularly. So I'm going to be talking about mental health in schools. And my focus today is going to be on peer relationships. And I think you got a sense of that from the films, didn't you, just now, those two films, which were great. I'm going to be talking about why kids' interactions with each other, their peer interactions, their friendships, who they hang out with or who they don't hang out with, that those relationships are a window onto children's mental health. They influence and they're influenced by kids' mental health. So I'm going to start off very simply by talking about what we can see. And that's always going to be the starting point, and that's of course behavior. So we're going to be looking at children's social behavior, but the social behavior we're going to focus on, we're going to understand this time from the perspective not of an adult or a parent or a teacher, but from the perspective of the children themselves. So one of my key messages is to hear the voices of the children themselves when we want to understand mental health in the school setting. We want to understand how children are feeling themselves, and we also want to understand reputation within the peer group. You can see all sorts of patterns within a peer group. Social behaviors that might be very desirable, that we might like to see, like comforting or helping, or uh, resolving conflicts peacefully, all that good stuff. But there also might be aggressive or disruptive behavior. Or there might be very withdrawn, isolated, socially isolated behaviors. And the thing is that when we ask children about these things, we get a very particular perspective, which teachers, staff members, adults, parents, we might not as adults really pick up on necessarily. And I think that's a really important point, to really get to the heart of the matter by understanding what children themselves think. Now, we also need to focus our attention on one really important thing, the points of influence within a class. We need to understand where those points of influence are because children who are experiencing mental health difficulties might not necessarily be just experiencing those difficulties in isolation. They might be bouncing off all sorts of dynamics which are going on in the classroom. So for example, I bet some of you have come across situations where you get someone who is perceived to be very popular by everybody, by the kids, by teachers, by parents, and yet, they might be the least cooperative, most disruptive kids. Have you come across that kind of situation, right? It's actually a phenomenon now. We talk about the distinction between likability and popularity. It's very interesting. The interesting thing, I think, in terms of mental health is not necessarily what's going on for those individual kids, but what the knock-on effects are on all the other kids. And in particular, I've done a lot of work with vulnerable children who maybe come in without the kind of secure foundations at home. I do a lot of work with children who are in the care system, um, children who are experiencing real problems in their peer relationships. Kind of like we saw in the film just now. Children who are really finding things difficult, and they get a message about what it means to be socially successful based on those representations of popularity. They think that's what it means to be a socially successful child. Okay, and that can be hugely misleading. And we all conspire in it because we also think they're the most popular children. Yet, the biggest predictor of really having positive relationships with other people, the biggest predictor from three years old all the way through to sixth form college and frankly into our lives as adults, is simply cooperative behavior. That's what we like. We like to be around people who are kind and helpful and cooperative. So how do we promote those kinds of things and find a way of building a network of positive social relationships? Of course, the key is we need to go beneath the behavior, right? We need to go beneath the surface and understand how children are thinking, what their goals are, what their values are, what do they think is important in life? And we need to actually talk about those things. The interesting thing I think about all of this is that when we're interacting with children, we so often in schools get focused on the behavior level. We so often tinker with trying to get the desirable behavior that we miss the really crucial dynamics that are going on that relate to mental health. 
a big message for me is where does that cognition come from? Where do those values come from? Where does that ability to empathize or to take other people's perspectives that enable you to really build healthy relationships with each other, where does all of that come from? And the answer, of course, is simple. It comes from social interaction. We learn about social interaction. We learn how to tune into our own and each other's minds, what other people are feeling, what they're thinking, how we can connect to them. We learn about all of that stuff from interacting with other people. So, to me, the context is really crucial. And of course, key context in children's lives are family, community, but school is one of them as well. And yet, I want to talk for a moment about the direction of travel. Quite often now, we hear a lot about mental health in young people, right? That there's sometimes people will say, a crisis in mental health. We've got so many young people who need support, who need help. And that's all, all absolutely fair and reasonable conclusion to make. And there's good evidence, in fact, for there being significantly increased problems with mental health. But we run a very big risk. The risk is that we individualize the mental health difficulties. We begin to think that the mental health problems reside within the individual child. And we neglect the context of our peril. I really believe that. So in a school uh, system now, we see an increasing attention to mental health. There's a bigger focus on, we've got to be able to identify mental health difficulties, catch them early, and provide support. And I kind of agree with that, yeah? We need to pick up on the difficulties. And as I said, I think getting the voice for the children is really crucial here. We do need to pick up on the difficulties early. And we do need to provide support, whether it's more counseling approaches, whether it's more opportunities for, like we saw in the film, CAM services to be better linked in with schools. I do a lot of that kind of work myself. But I'm gonna say right here that that can only be part of the solution. Because the truth of the matter is that mental health doesn't just reside within an individual. It's not just inside the kids. Mental health resides in relationships. Mental health resides in the way that young people, just like us, interact with each other and everybody they encounter in their lives. So we need to pay attention to the context. We need to think, if we're really serious about mental health in schools, we need to think about changing the context, not just changing the child. So what does changing the context actually mean? Well, I don't think it can be a tick box exercise. It's not quite as simple as finding an initiative that has a bunch of resources attached to it, and then you get a teacher in the school, or the pastoral team, or the learning mentor, or whoever it might be, or a school counselor, to go and deliver that package. It's not as simple as having a terrific PSHE program, because important as those things may be, it's only a fraction of the experience. You're not really getting at the context, right? Because a child could walk out of a brilliant PSHE lesson, but go straight into another class with another teacher who doesn't even have to think about it from their point of view. Oh, that's what, that's what Joanne does. I don't deal with the mental health side of things. That's not my job. I, my job is only if I spot a real problem, then I, then I point them in the direction of the wellbeing service in the school because we've got great school counselors. That might be all true, and you can clearly see it's not the solution, because what really matters is the everyday, informal interactions that kids have with each other. So what's the barrier at the moment? I think the barrier is probably going to be things like what schools are under pressure with, which of course is going to be things like academic results, and the tables, and how the kids are doing on their test results. But I guess the one glimmer of hope and I do a lot of work with uh, government agencies and uh, um, local governments and charities. The one glimmer of hope that I keep bringing up is that we've got such a good evidence base to show that in mental health and well-being, all the positive relationships that engender that positive mental health, that those things go hand in hand with academic achievement. It's not the case that if you spend time on mental health in schools, you're doing it at the detriment of the academic agenda. The two things go together. So I guess my concluding point is really, 
and this is where it becomes more like an activist movement kind of thing, we've got to start recognizing that mental health in schools is not some peripheral thing. It's not just about the kids who are the problem kids and now we have to get someone to fix them. It's about making mental health in schools a core part of the context. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so we I told straight from primary right through to post. The thing is that all of that learning is taking place anyway, right? But sometimes the teaching, right, the informal teaching isn't that great. You know what I'm saying? So you've got a child in a classroom. Whether the teacher thinks that they're doing any lessons on emotional literacy or not, whether they say that I'm doing something on PSHE or emotional intelligence or character development or resilience, whether or not they're doing it, the thing is they are giving the child messages because children are getting data from every interaction that they have, just like they get data from every interaction they have with the family. So for my part, I would say, let's talk about it. Let's think, how can we make that messaging a bit smarter? Now, a key point, though, if we are going to focus on the emotional and social dynamics as well as the cognitive and academic dynamics, then we've got to ask ourselves, have we got a workforce which is adequately prepared for that? What about their own well-being? What about their own social development? Yeah. And let me make this clear as well. This isn't about the um, adults being the authority figures who know all this stuff, right? It's about learning together. And I think that's a really important thing. This isn't necessarily about trying to get the kids to come to the right answer of this is what you should do when you encounter a conflict. It's the process of exploring that together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what you were saying about that um, there needs to be uh, uh, an examination of the context yes. instead of just looking at the individuals. Yeah. Um, for me, I think that, yeah, that sounds good, but um, I, I, I keep thinking we need to look at the system itself yeah. because it's the, it's the way that the system works that creates yeah. part of, a big part of the problem. So yeah. I see all these good things as applications and applications, but it's just going on top of a sort of a system that creates the, yeah. the mental health. You're absolutely right, and there's a political context to it as well, so we've got to think about what are the pressures that schools are under, and of course, I know I could have a whole other talk about the societal context as well, like what kind of society are we becoming, what do we value as a society, what messages do we give to children about what's important in life, you know, you ask yourself, what do you think your kids get from experiencing modern life in Britain about what it means to be successful? And what does success look like in modern Britain? I think it's a really interesting question. Now, those are big questions. Right? What do we do about the system, the big societal structures, the policies, the political context for education, all of that? We can't turn that, over, uh, turn that around overnight. But we can work on those things, but at the same time recognize that there are differences even within that system. Just like families vary from one to another in terms of the culture and ethos, right? I bet you could imagine that just from a family you know. The same is true in schools. And I'm really fascinated by that. I don't have the answers yet in terms of how we really get at it, but I bet some of you, I don't know if you've ever done the thing where you've gone around secondary schools when you're, when you're a child in year six, right? You've done that thing. Um, it's quite interesting because you go into different school and you get a different feel. You know what I mean? That sort of walking in and you just pick up on something. I'm really interested in whether that's a real thing. How do we get at it? What does it mean? When we say we're a friendly ethos, what does that actually mean? And the thing is that there are variations like that which matter even within the system. So I guess my answer to the question is yes, you're absolutely right. We need to work on the system and we can't just do sticking glasses all the time but we also have things that we can do right here, right now, in terms of really making brave decisions about bringing mental health into the school context. Okay, hi, uh, hi Robin. Um, 
There's two things I want to do, blow the trumpet of the feeling good feeling safe, whole school approach at Safety Net got in 80% of primary schools at the moment. And I think it's really good as parents and the professionals as well to question schools. Like what is your whole school approach to well-being? And um, so that you know when we're looking at schools for our children or when we're involved in schools, so we sort of gently and collaboratively actually bring it up. That if we need a universal approach, we don't we need a cultural shift, we don't need the just the sticking plasters. Mm -hmm. But also at least a few months ago, I thought the council were using um, and going into schools and talking a lot more about rather than behaviour management. Mm -hmm. Um, which I feel very passionate about, the, that's all in the language, it says it all really, mm. and the shifting towards emotional coaching and going and training teachers and head teachers and support staff to talk to children differently, even when they're trying to get their shoes on, let alone when they're having a massive meltdown about something. Yeah, I mean, it's have, really have you seen anything about that? What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen some really creative efforts to take that kind of thing forward. I don't think we yet have really good data on exactly yeah. what the best strategies are to create that kind of system change within a school, let alone the whole system that you were talking about before. Um, but what I would say is that paying attention, you know, like what you were saying about how you talk with the children, I think that's absolutely crucial. We know from decades of research in developmental <laughs> psychology that how parents talk with their children is important. We need to start thinking about actually what's the everyday informal, typical interactions like for kids in a school context. And of course they'll differ from teacher to teacher, from staff member to staff member, but they differ from school to school as well. So I'm really interested in that kind of everyday interaction. What you might consider the trivial low level stuff might turn out to be much more important than the high profile, we've got X number of school counsellors in our school. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. 